to this service of communion, friends. My name is Andy Truex, and I'm glad that you have chosen to make this a part of your day. Whether you are with us here in person or watching online, we're so glad that you are with us at this moment. Of course, if you think about the calendar and the way the week starts out, if we come to church on Sunday, we are starting our week in a great fashion. But this is September 1st, so we are actually starting our month in a great fashion fashion, right? For communion, if you haven't had communion with us before, we do celebrate an open table, which means you do not need to be a member here. You do not need to be a United Methodist member. We want you to partake in this Holy Communion. If you're a guest with us, I do want to encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards. It's about this big in the pew in front of you. It's a way for us to know a little bit more about you and also a way for us to get a hold of you and tell you more about what's happening here in the life of the church that we think you might be interested in hearing. There was a time when I sang in a choir, I know it's hard to believe, and we had something called a chorister's prayer. Within it contained a line that went like this, Lord grant that what we sing with our lips, we believe in our hearts. 
and what we believe in our hearts we may show forth in our lives. And I believe over the course of this service, through song, through liturgy, through scripture, and preaching, we will marry those two things, what we say with our lips and believing in our hearts. But uh, to talk with us a little bit more about what we can do to have that show forth in our lives, I invite David Lindquist to come up here and talk with us about worshiping outside the walls. David? All right, with, a, with fall, since 2011, it also brings another important thing for this congregation, is our worship outside the walls. Wow. Um, since 2011, most, most people here have kind of been a part of this, but there's people who may not have been. So we set aside a Sunday morning where we don't have Sunday school, we don't have worship um, the, the same way. We start at 8.30 um, over in the Family Life Center. We have a quick breakfast, a quick worship together with six other churches from different denominations, different ethnicities. And then we um, have divided up and already signed up before. Half the group goes and does a work project from construction, some heavy lifting stuff, some gardening, to sewing little dresses for kids in Africa, for cutting, to making cards for first responders. There's something for everybody. And then the other half has signed up to go do worship at a nursing home or a um, assisted living home. So it's, it's a place where we really just get off our comfort zones and get out and, and, and show um, that we know that God loves us and we, we, we want to respond and show that love to other people. I've, I've learned to say, you know, I think there's three important reasons we do this every year. Um, one is we are called to love our neighbors. And this is a very pal palatable, palpable way to do that. This is a real way to show our, to love our neighbors. Number two, though, I really know we do this for ourselves. All of us need to get out of our comfort zone sometimes. And it can get where we really get comfortable in our pew and we sit in the same place and we do the same thing. And this is, stretches us a little bit and we need that. The third that's really kind of become a neat part of it is there's not many times when the capital C church um, looks like it should look, where there are people from all ethnicities and all denominations are being one with Jesus. And this, this week is a, is a very um, real way to look at that too. So look in there, we, you'll see some ways to sign up. You can scan the QR code. If you don't know how to do that, ask somebody who's um, less than 50 how to do that. Um, <laughs> And you can go on the website, just on our First Methodist website, it'll have a link to how to sign up. The best way is to sign up and you get exactly what you want to do. Um, if, you'll, if you fill out a form and sign it, someone will sign you up for you, but we'll, we'll, pick, your, um, we'll pick your group. So the best way is just go online. And there's a thing for breakfast too. So we're excited about it. It's, it's September 29th, so four Sundays from now. Four Sundays from now. Be, put it on your calendar. Think about, look, look with your family where you want to serve that week. And uh, we're excited about it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. We are here because Jesus has called us. Strangers and friends, locals and guests, believers and doubters, the certain and the curious. It's always a mixed company that Jesus gathers and invites to his table where, in bread and wine, he meets us there. And through him, we who are different are joined in each other. So come, not because you understand, but because you are understood. Come not because you deserve a place, but because Jesus invites you just as you are. Trusting in the mercy of God our helper, let us confess our need. God of mercy and compassion, we've come to this moment as those needing what you alone can give. We bring ourselves before you. We bring not only the parts we want you and others to see, but also the parts we wish we could hide. O oh Lord, you know the things we've done but should not have, and the things we should have done but didn't. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to experience the joy of serving you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Since Jesus died for us, we have peace with God, to whom be praised and honored forever. In Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus welcomed all who came into his presence. So let us welcome one another in Christ's name and pass the peace among us. Will you please stand and greet one another? Satisfy the hungry heart with gift of finest sweet. Come and give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to eat. You give yourself to us, O Lord, then a selfless let us be. seated. If you would, please turn in your hymnal to page 13. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. 
make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you and for me and for the sins of the whole world. Thanks be to God. The cup of salvation offered to you and to me and to as many as will receive it in our Savior's shed blood. Thanks be to God. The joyful feast of our Lord is ready for you and me. Will you come?
Let's give thanks to God as we pray together. Eternal God, as those who have been nourished in this holy meal and set free by your merciful love in Jesus Christ, help us to live gratefully as his disciples, giving ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
That was absolutely beautiful choir, just beautiful. Have you ever thought about how much this church gives to you each and every Sunday? You walk in and the first thing you get is a smile. The ushers will greet you with a smile and then they hand you or they give you a bulletin. You are given shelter from the heat, the rain, the wind, occasionally the cold, etc. A few moments ago you were given an invitation to come to the Lord's table where you were given. You didn't take communion, you were given communion. You are presented with beautiful music, beautiful music, and every week you are given a word of God by our pastors, and you are given the opportunity to worship together in a faith community. In a moment, you will be given the opportunity to give a portion of the gifts God has given you to aid this church in its ministry. So now you need to make a choice. Will you give God your first fruits or whatever you have left? That change you found in the bottom of your purse or the coins that were stuck between the cushions in the sofa or in that cup holder, you know, the one I'm talking about that has all the soda stuck in there and you get those sticky coins. What will you give to draw closer to God? And that's what you're doing when you give an offering is you are drawing closer to God. Will the ushers please come forward as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for all the good things you continue to provide and give us. Don't let us take our gifts for granted or abuse them. Instead, help us always to rely on you in faith. Use us and what you have given us for your good purposes. Bless these gifts and the givers alike. Amen.
Um, this is a reading from the scriptures, Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Acts 2, 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. May God bless the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good music, like good poetry, is timeless, especially if it deals with the human condition. People in all generations can relate to the words, even if the tunes may have gone out of style. Such is the case with Paul Simon's song, I Am a Rock, which was recorded way back in 1965. It's a song about isolation and emotional detachment. It's sung as a song of defiance with the singer speaking to himself about not needing people or love. One verse says, I've built walls, a fortress steep and mighty that none can penetrate. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving I disdain. I am a rock. I am an island. But as you listen to the song, you realize this is not a song of defiant victory. It's a song of sad delusion. You're sad for the singer of these words because you know that despite his assertions, he's wrong. In fact, the title of that song refers to um, the title of English poet John Donne's famous poem from a couple of centuries prior, which says, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Friends, you and I are living during a time of crisis, even though it is one about which we don't speak enough. Many of us are afraid to speak of. We're beginning to hear some voices uh, there are starting, there are the, some articles beginning to gain a, our attention. But even among those of us who suffer the effects of this crisis, we are in too many cases like the person singing in the Paul Simon song, telling ourselves, I'm okay. Or perhaps failing to even realize Something very important is missing from our lives. We assume this is just the way things are. This is just the way things have to be. This is the way it is in modern times. I'm referring to the sharp rise in mental illness, loneliness, depression, and anxiety in our society. Sociologists and psychologists and preachers and teachers are especially concerned with the sharp upward spike among teenagers and young adults. Now, the evidence is pretty strong. 
that this has a lot to do with smartphones and screens and the ways that virtual relationships have, for many people, taken the place of authentic face-to-face -face relationships. Um, let me share some statistics with you. The incidence of major depression among teens has risen sharply since 2010. If you read the statistics, what you're going to learn is that a lot of these researchers mark 2009 or 2010 as the time when these fairly steady lines all of a sudden begin this sharp upward curve. curve. And this is the time that smartphones came into vogue. 2008 or 9, I think it was, the iPhone was introduced. In 2010, uh, they, were, they became ubiquitous with, uh, with a large number of people having them. Um, so they focus on this point. Since 2010, there has been a 145% increase in major depression among teenage girls. Among boys, there's been a 161% increase. Now, generally speaking, the, number of the, the total number of girls is higher than boys, but both genders report this sharp uptick. In terms of mental illness among college students, there's been a 100% increase in anorexia, a 100% increase in depression, and a 134% increase in anxiety disorder. But it's not just teens. We should notice this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to talk about three age groups, uh, 35 to 49, uh, 26 to 34, and then 18 to 25. Okay, so we're going to go down in the age groups. In the 35 to 49 age group, there's been a 52 percent increase in anxiety disorder. That is huge. Among those 26 to 34, there's been a 103% increase. And for those 18 to 25, a 139% increase. Emergency room visits for cases of self-harm have increased 48% for boys and 188% for girls. And now I want to talk about maybe the most discouraging and saddest of these. For younger adolescents, and we're talking about ages 10 to 14, 10 to 14, there's been a 91% increase in suicide for boys and a 167% increase for girls. Does our Christian faith have anything to say that can help us understand and do something about these alarming trends? The answer is yes. If we're willing to hear the voices, if we're willing to notice what's gone wrong, and if we're willing to take these wisd this wisdom to heart, and that's what I want to explore with you for the rest of the sermon this morning. Uh, Mary Truex shared with us uh, an interesting Bible pa verse. Um, you've read it probably dozens of times. Um, it's more intriguing than you may realize. Um, it comes from the Bible's book of Genesis, creation story. Um, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. You may know that there are actually two stories of creation in the Genesis account. Uh, the one is, is where male and female are. Now, just for those who may have trouble with that, uh, for that reality, most of us have sort of blended these stories in our mind. One does not necessarily exclude the other, and I don't mean to, uh, I don't mean to say that it does. But in the first story, God just makes the human beings, male and female, he created them. He creates male and female together. In the second story, that's the one with more details. That's the one where uh, God creates just the man first. And uh, where God then takes a rib from Adam and makes Eve out of it. Um, 
I've heard it said that God created the man, looked, and said, I can do better than that, and created woman, <laughs> and therefore created woman. Um, but before the woman is made, God looks and says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a, him a helper as his partner. Now, you can read this, and some do, as if God is looking and realizes, i got to figure out a way for these people to reproduce themselves, or I'm going to spend all my time just making people. And you can read it that way. Our better scholars say this is a profoundly insightful statement about what it means to be human. We are not meant to be alone. We are social creatures. We are meant to live in community with others. We may, like the singer of that Paul Simon song, defiantly say to ourselves, I don't need anyone. I'm fine all by myself. But living that way is a pale shadow of what life is like, meant to be like. It's not how God intended life to be or how God intended things to work. In the second reading that Mary shared with us, we have an account from the days of the early church. Um, the story of the birth of the church is in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, that's when we're told that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles gathered together in, uh, in the temple uh, on the day of Pentecost, and Peter got up and preached, and, and uh, the church was born. Still in that same chapter, we're told about what life was like in the early days of the church. And what it says is, all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They'd sell their possessions and goods, distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent time together in the temple. They broke bread at homes. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to, the, to their number those who were being saved. Do you hear what's going on here? These people spent time together. They shared words and conversation. They shared meals together. They helped one another in person. That's how things are supposed to be. I think there are a lot of us who um, would like to get together with other people, but we're sort of afraid. Um, will I be imposing on them? I'm sort of scared of putting myself out there. If only there was a place where people got together and, uh, and talked about really important stuff. Well, guess what? People discovered the need for that a long time ago, and that's what we do in church. That's what corporate worship is about, coming together. Um, but besides that, the church also has things like Bible studies and pickleball, and we have 42 games and a sewing group. We've got all these examples of people getting together. The church has these things called Sunday school classes, small groups. Someone says, eh, I've heard of that, but I just want to be with people I already like. Okay? Or I just want to be with people who think like me. And my sincere question to anyone who feels that way, and there's a lot of them, there's a lot of us, is really, are you sure? In my opinion, one of the reasons so many people are so divided and antagonistic toward one another is because we have locked ourselves in these little echo chambers where we only listen to people who say what we already believe and think. And if someone says something that we don't like, we just delete them or we unfriend them or we go searching for someone else who can, will confirm our present attitudes and ideas and beliefs. Here's, a, here's just a very sincere and I, hope, I think helpful question. How is that helping you grow? What sort of muscles is that developing? It doesn't take much to just delete. How is that helping you develop the muscles needed to deal with people who are not like you? Jesus said, if you love only those who love you, what's so great about that? 
Even the sinners love those who don't love them, who, who, who love them. And if you do good to only those who do good to you, what's so great about that? Even the sinners do that much. No, we need other kind of people. Do you realize that if you happen to interact, I'm going to assume that you're a good, fine, upstanding person with no faults, okay? Um, this is how I look at you. Um, but do you realize that if you just happen to be with someone who perhaps is not that way, judgy, gossipy, condescending, um, whatever, do you realize that you help them by your mere presence? Even without preaching to them, you're showing them something different. That doesn't happen unless you're with that other person. Surely we understand the importance of being with others, not of our race, religion, ethnicity, social class, education level. How that is so important to our development so that we begin to understand that goodness and compassion and dignity don't necessarily have anything to do with those categories. It's good for us to be with people who are different than us. And what about those, let's just go ahead and ask it, okay? Those with problems. Some people are weird. Some people are whiny. Some people are inappropriate. Don't all of us need the, to develop the ability and grace to look at them and listen to them and be compassionate toward them? Sooner or later, we all need grace and mercy, not only from God, but from others. I've put my foot in my mouth a few times. I've done a few things that I wish I could take back. I'm really grateful for those who were able to deal with that, not write me off. Forgive me. Give me a few other opportunities to prove who I am and what I'm like. Now, my take on history, on the swing of history's pendulum makes, makes me hopeful. You read history, you understand. We go too far this direction, and we realize, ah, that's not working. We went too far. Let's bring it a little back. It happens in politics and all kinds of other things. Uh, so I'm hoping that's going to be the case in terms of us relate, getting away from relating to one another only through screens. Realizing face-to-face -face relationships are important. Hands-on helping and caring about others. And don't forget, we're giving you an opportunity to do that. With Wow Sunday to come up here. Some people say, why would I want to go to an old folks home and lead worship there? Might be good for you. Might be good to uh, be able to be with that kind of person. Why would I want to be on a work project with some people I don't know from another church? Well, let's see. Might do you some good. Might develop some muscles. Without that kind of exposure and exercise, it's as if we develop a kind of rickets in our soul and spirit. We haven't received this vital nutrient that we all need. Okay, let's move toward the end of the sermon. For all the statistics that are telling us that people are attending church less, spending more time in isolation, getting their information from God knows where on the Internet, I am still hopeful that uh, we will be wise enough to realize that the convenience of staying home on a Sunday morning is not worth the trade of what we lose by isolating, not being a part of what the Bible says you really need. It's not good that the people be alone. Even the very discipline of getting up and making ourselves get dressed and then go to a place that somewhere in our minds we've been told is a good thing, builds us up. Not to mention 
the blessing that our presence is to others as an encouragement and an example. This is not a new phenomenon. May have reached a new stage. It's not a new phenomenon. In the Bible's book of Hebrews, we have this verse. Some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you day, see the day that the Lord's coming is getting closer. Um, what to do? Well, the first is, I think, acknowledge if there's any truth to this. Um, and then reach out, send a text, an email, make a phone call. Well, what will I say? Here's what you say. I was thinking about you. You came across my mind. I miss you. I think I need your friendship in my life. There's all kinds of things. It need not be awkward. I was just thinking about you. It's going to be necessary for us to be deliberate and intentional about this. I really do think so. The pull of those screens, the movement that way is just almost inexorable. But for those that can notice and see and recognize that there may be a lack, will I hope find the courage through God's presence and spirit to do what is needed. Some years back, Georgia and I finally got to go see the giant redwood trees of Northern California. It was a really interesting experience. There were lots of people from all over the United States who had gathered in the parking lot. I mean, there was a steady flow of people in and out. Folks were getting out of the cars and visiting and laughing and joking and calling to one another. Uh, the place you went was into the ranger station where you could get a map and maybe buy some souvenirs and where everyone had to buy, pay for admission to the forest. So there was just lots of friendly banter. But when you got your admission ticket, you walked through a door and somehow we're immediately in the forest and without any signs being required and without anyone standing there to tell you, people's voices became hushed. There was a sense of reverent awe about being in this majestic forest. I have discovered the same thing happens when people first stand at the rim of the Grand Canyon. It's very interesting. You're outdoors, but people aren't shouting or calling. They talk in hushed tones. The giant redwoods are the largest living things on earth and the tallest trees in the world. Some of them are over 300 feet tall. They are 2,500 years old. Now, you'd think that trees so large must have a tremendous root system that reaches down hundreds of feet into the earth. But in fact, the redwoods have a very shallow root system. I read about a guide leading some visitors through the forest one day and told of this surprising fact how the trees actually have roots that just are barely below the surface. One man said, that's impossible. I grew up on a farm. I'm a country boy. I know that if you don't grow roots way deep, strong winds are going to blow those trees over. And the guide said, not these trees. They only grow in groves. And their roots intertwine under the surface of the earth. And when the strong winds come, they hold each other up. They intentionally lock 
onto each other. And when those storms come, and they do, and when the winds blow, which they will, and when the lightning flashes, which happens, other trees may crack and split and blow over and fall to the ground, but not the redwood. They may sway, they may bend, but they sway together, and they bend together, and they stand together. Redwood trees do not fall because of their individual power or extraordinarily deep rootedness. They do not fall because they are a community. Each tree is related to all the other trees in the grove, and each tree's life depends on the other Sort of like the way we're supposed to be. In a world where there are strong forces that threaten to isolate us, let's fight to make sure we live as God intended us to live together. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Tully. So many of you in this room are good at building community, keeping in touch with one another, sending a card, stopping by, bringing a covered dish, inviting someone to something. But if I had to pick a person in this room who has that skill set and is a pro, it's Dr. Carol Farah. Today is her last Sunday as our accompanist. Again, yes, again. But she's not going far is the good news. She'll still be here, which means she might have more time to do even more of that. Right, Carol? <laughs> Let's sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, number 557 in your hymnals. Let's stand. <laughs> As we leave this place, what is our mission? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation 
of the world. I am so proud to see how many of you took all those do unto others signs home last week. Happy to report that we are out, but we have more coming in Tuesday, correct? So if you'd like to take another one home, or if you have a friend, he or she says, I would really love to have one of those, we encourage you to grab another one on Tuesday. I think that's all that I have, Dr. Tolley. Thanks, Andy. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to encourage you about the signs. We want these all over town. I've got people driving down from Oklahoma to come pick some up here, okay? The message is so right, so timely, and so needed. So I encourage you. Sorry we, we ran out, but it's your own fault, okay? <laughs> but we got some more, and they'll be here on Tuesday, so come on in, all right? Um, thank you again for your presence. And we receive this benediction. Go from this place to make connection and get connection so that you and I might be the means by which we become saved and offer salvation to others through Christ our Lord. Go in peace. Amen.